This is Jonathan Ferguson, the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which has a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And in this week's episode, he's going to be checking out the weapons of Milsim Shooter Armour Reforger. Okay, it looks like they're not yet modelling the actual rocket inside the tube. But hey, you're only going to spot that if you go into photo mode and look down the front, or stupidly stand in front of your teammate and look down his uh, anti-tank weapon. Make sure to check out our previous episode on the Firearms of Armour 3, and while you're there, subscribe for more videos just like this. And if there are any other games, guns, or mechanics that you guys want to see Jonathan break down, let us know in the comment section below. Right, over to Jonathan. So right away, the realism kind of hits you in the face and the ears, because the uh, the sound of near misses from bullets. It's almost like watching combat footage to a degree, uh, as much of a degree as, as is possible, basically, with the game. You can instantly tell that this is much more of a simulation than other games like Call of Duty. It's the obvious comparison. The rifle I'm seeing here is the M16A2, the actual USGI, as it were, M16A2, with the adjustable rear sights, the heavy barrel. So it's the, it's the A2, really looks like they've nailed it. I can't think of anything really to, to criticize here. I don't know if they've modeled the burst fire correctly, such that if you come off the trigger too soon, you'll end up with either two or one rounds in your next burst. I'll watch a bit more and see if that eventuates. <laughs> it might not, but it's a, genu a genuine complaint of this rifle. Burst fire, that's the other aspect of the um, American issue m 1682 So this game, um, I did have to look it up, this game takes place in 1989. This rifle was only introduced to the US Army, which is the, the force being uh, represented here, in 1986. And even then, not every unit got it right away. So, although whilst we'd probably be seeing uh, A2s, if we're gonna nitpick, and I have to, because I can't find anything else to, to complain about, the wear on this rifle, it seems a bit excessive for three years service. We've got high point wear on the uh, this lump here where the, the cam pin rotates into on the inside of the gun, that's what this is for. We've got wear on the carry handle, wear on the magazine well. Now our example has got the beginnings of wear through to the aluminium or aluminum if you prefer, around here. And admittedly, it's probably seen almost no use, but still, a bit too worn. That's the best I can come up with, guys. I do, I do like the way that, and this is not exclusive to this game by any means, but the way the iron sights move relative to each other as you move around. It used to be if you had iron sights in a game, they'd be a fixed sight picture and they'd never move relative to the movement of the player. It just it adds a little bit of realism and also that that rear sight. So that's the that's the close combat type aperture that is visible, just like on the screen. Both of them are fully enclosed by the sight protectors. That's why they're called sight protectors. But the number of games that get that wrong and have the uh, the M16 or AR15 sight sticking above the, the ears here is at least several that do that. And what would happen, you drop it, deform your rear sight, and suddenly your shots aren't landing where you're, where you're placing them. Reloading animations, absolutely fine as far as I'm concerned. A, a pitfall for a game like this that's going back in time 30 odd years is that you end up using anachronistic animations or, or positions and holds <laughs> of what happens as well because training has changed quite a bit even since 1989 so you're not necessarily going to well you're not going to see john wick flicks of magazine or even pressing the pressing the magazine catch and letting the magazine fall out i'm sure that was done i'm pretty sure it wasn't taught so, so you probably would be removing the magazine with your Hand. Any veterans who served with these, of course, defer to you on that one. But to me, this looked plausible for, and I suspect they have looked at the drill manuals, hopefully it involved some veterans as well. All right, we've got the M203. Um, our only 203s are on A1s. Very obviously, they replaced the the handguard, and they have a simple tangent sight. You adjust vertically and then aim up to, to compensate. So here, what we're seeing is the, the soldier is aiming roughly at an angle, and I, I gather at least in Vietnam, they would use a bit of instinct and experience in aiming, but uh, what you're supposed to do is flip the sights up and, and aim using the sight, obviously. You've only got so many of these rounds, and you want them to land 
where you want them to go. So I assume that's a feature that will be implemented later on, though. That would be too much of an oversight to be accidental. Got the Beretta M9, recently introduced at this time. Came in 85 onwards, if I remember rightly, to the, to the US forces. We don't have an M9 per se, annoyingly. One of one of many US general issue variants of things that we do have, but we don't, if that makes sense to you. So anyway, this is the M9 in civilian form. So it's the M92F. Um, this Flush of flat dust cover here is a feature of the US M9. You might be able to spot an M9, or at least spot something that's wrong in a game if it has the angle dust cover of later civilian 92 FSs. But this is the, the, the broad type. And one minor technical issue I noticed is when this pistol ran out of ammunition, so locked open on the empty magazine, the trigger was in the forward position. Uh, in theory, ready for double action fire, whereas in fact it should be toward the rear of the trigger guard because the weapon's cocked, because the slide is over the top of the hammer. The, the reload might look a bit a bit janky to those of us used to modern uh, Call of Duty Battlefield games and, uh, and games of that ilk where they're, they're using or referencing modern tactical reloading techniques. The fact that he is assisting the magazine out with finger and thumb and then kind of inserting it like this, unsupported, and then slapping it in, exactly what you'd have seen at the time. Now, this is a specific variant of the M14 that we don't have, and I don't have any real experience of, but it is the M21. About the only thing I can say intelligently about this that isn't readily available elsewhere, is that it gets described as the M21 sniper weapon system. Now, I'm a bit of a fan of nomenclature and etymology and words and stuff. And I, as far as I know, that was only applied to the M24. Um, it's one of these things where this was the M21 sniper rifle and they were looking for a whiz bang new name for the new program. And that's where sniper weapon system came in. So I think it's being replied, uh, applied, sorry, retrospectively for this. In terms of what it is, if you don't know the M14, you need to get yourself a gun book. It's, although very short, short lived, only I think seven years in frontline service. Lots of soldiers really, really liked it for its stopping power, range, ability to penetrate like cover and that kind of thing. And it made an awful lot of sense to become the next sniper rifle for the US Army when, you know, because you have a, a, a rifle firing quite a lightweight cartridge in the M16 to have something more powerful and longer range. Well, we have thousands of these things in the armories. Let's get them out. Let's get them set up with a good scope. And the M21 was born. So it's, it's actually an automatic M14 with the selector removed, but then nearly all M14s did have the selector removed. So that in itself doesn't make it an M21. Really being selected for accuracy and having the scope mount, uh, the receiver tapped for the scope mount having a scope mount, having a scope, and the markings, that's what makes it an M21. Right, we've got the, the M249 again, but it's in a highly appropriate context as the standard US Army squad automatic weapon, which is the tactical niche that the M249 was adopted to fill. It is a light machine gun in a, in a technical definition, but it's a squad automatic weapon or perhaps a light support weapon in other countries' terminology in its tactical name. Well, well done, as far as I can tell. We've got some clipping issues with the, the user's face and the stock, which is clearly not intentional. I'm sure is going to be addressed. Recoil looks right, the way it handles, the, the rate of fire. I mean, it's it's hard to get this thing this thing wrong at this point. It's, it's a video game staple as much as it is a military one. Although somewhat controversial in, in military use, depending on which armed force you're talking about and when. Currently not in use with the British Armed Forces. It's still in the inventory, but I don't believe it's being fielded. And uh, our forces ended up bringing back the the big brother, equivalent to the American M240, the L7, at the squad level, because the, the, uh, first we tried to replace that with the LSW, the, the SA80, the L86, A1, and A2, and then they tried to bring in the Belgian Minimi, which is, of course, what this is, and that kind of sort of seemed to be working. It was very impressive and Gucci, but wasn't necessarily as accurate as it needed to be or as reliable as it needed to be in that 
situation. You know, US forces still using it. It's the latest thing in the inventory at this time. Well, not the latest thing, but one of them. And it's not the only machine gun in the game, so we'll move on. Right, we've got a, a Russian machine gun here. Should be recognizable to all of you. It's the PKM. Excellent weapon, lightweight, accurate enough, powerful enough, relatively low maintenance. It's the classic um, Spitfire Messerschmitt argument or, you know, between this and the FN Mag, the, the 240, the, the L7. Western forces will tend to say that the GPMG is best. The Eastern European countries, for example, would, would probably say that the, the PKM is best. And now you can decide for yourself by shooting at each other in this highly realistic video game. <laughs> the, the 249 doesn't barely move at all, which is pretty realistic. It's a not heavy machine gun by any means, but it's got sufficient weight to help keep that lightweight cartridge on, on target. Stark contrast with the PKM, which is relatively light for a full power machine gun, a general purpose machine gun, what it really is. Uh, here used in the light machine gun role, and there's a significant climb there. The, the player's having to compensate, um, presumably with a mouse. So lots of lots of climb, you'd expect that. So you could use this Rambo style from the hip, and Lord knows it's been done many times, usually not by trained soldiers, but uh, you are going to struggle to keep it on target uh, without a lot of practice. And of course, not very efficient in, in ammunition terms. I'm sure this isn't the first game to do this by any means, but it's the first time I've noticed it. And that's the realistic feed of the belt. The belt isn't just like, like artificially going into the side of the gun. It looks like it's getting dragged into the mechanism, which it should be. And you see the end of the belt come out of the gun and, sorry, sorry, come out of the belt box and go into the gun. That might be the most realistic depiction of belt feed that I've seen. That's nice, although I have slightly mixed feelings. So we've got the rear sight on this PKM being adjusted. So the slider is being slid and the ramp is therefore moving up and down. So you can clearly adjust your sights in this game, which I would expect, to be honest with you, some a game like this. What we don't see though, is the hand reach up and do that adjustment. We're not there yet, not with, not with this game. Adjustment of sights in a, a shooter is very rare. Sniping games sort of flirt with that, but it's it's pretty unusual to be able to change your adjust your adjust your sights. Now it seems from the on-screen information there that that is describes adjust zeroing, uh, which is not really the case. You're just adjusting your sights, you're not changing your zero. Zero is making point of aim and point of impact coincide, so that you can then use your gun. Zeroing is not adjusting the sights for range or to compensate for other things like wind. What I'm reliably informed was nicknamed the pig in service, the US M60. Iconic for us civilians in all sorts of different movies. This is its original configuration as issued back in Vietnam, and it was still the standard light machine gun, although they being augmented by the M249 as the squad automatic weapon in this time period. By this point, they were starting to wear out a little bit, and some of the problems that this thing is a bit infamous for now were already creeping in from what I understand. You know, it's almost like the US ordnance saw two very cool wartime German guns and went, what could be cooler? Well, both of them at once. And so we got, we got this thing, which had its issue. But it also has, has its supporters still around. Uh, we've got them, I say we, the RAF have got them mounted on as door guns on helicopters and things because they came with the helicopters. There are more modern versions, shorter, lighter, more tactically flexible with rails and and so on but for me this is a classic this is the rambo gun and uh this is a good good rendition of it it's nice to see a squad of um cold war era u.s soldiers you've got the riflemen popping away with their m16a2s and you've got the squad uh, machine gunner there with his m60 
Something I've noticed with a number of guns in this game, I don't think I'm imagining it, is we've got variable rates of fire. So you know when you look up a rate of fire of a gun, as you do, and it says between 600 and 650, or, or even, might even be 100 rounds per minute variation. Well, that's because, especially with belt-fed guns, I have to drag the belt into themselves. There is some variability, depending on ammunition, consistency of ammunition, uh, how dirty they are, how they're being held even, depending on how, how they work. And so a real gun does not robotically fire one shot every 800 rounds per minute, like a, like you know a fixed figure would indicate. So machine guns often do give a variable rate, even, even automatic rifles. Now it's very slightly, barely detectable, but I think I can hear it in this game. And that would be the first time I've noticed that. If, I, if I'm right about that, that's I think uh, something to something to celebrate. <laughs> Right, AK-74, we've covered well, all sorts of AKs by this point, including 74s. I don't think I've shown you this one before. There are many like it, but this one is ours. <laughs> uh, this one's dated 1983, so that makes it pretty bang on correct for this game. Still with the wooden laminate furniture, i.e. handguard and buttstock, but for a long time by this point, we've got the uh, plastic pistol grip and the plastic uh, polymer magazines. This is super detailed and very, very well modeled indeed. Including down to the recoil, uh, i.e. not much, because this muzzle brake compensator is, is highly effective. Prior to the modern raft of Western muzzle devices, this was basically the gold standard for recoil mitigation in an infantry rifle. Little details like the gas block pattern is, is correct. Um, I, I probably have to go in with a set of virtual calipers to try and like find fault with this. It's it's spot on. Right down to the markings on the trunnion, which are which are correct. Really, really good. So instead, I'll talk briefly about the sound um, design. Perhaps to be expected, but the reports is you know the guns sound very different to each other, as you might expect. Certainly between calibers, and then in and out of enclosed spaces. So the 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 punch of that rifle report as you move into the building there, audibly very different. Dynamic sound is not a new thing by any means, but uh, this game is doing everything well, as far as I can see. Any like early build glitches and so on, notwithstanding. Okay, it looks like they're not yet modeling the actual rockets inside the tube. It appears to be an empty tube and a rocket magically appears from it. But hey, you're only going to spot that if you go into photo mode and look down the front or stupidly stand in front of your teammate and look down his uh, anti-tank weapon. The law, Law's rocket M73 variant, I think. Well, we don't have that, but we do have the British issue version. Rocket 66 millimeter, heat, high explosive anti-tank, L1, A1. Identical to the US, the original issue US version of the uh, light anti-tank weapon, Law, has the same firing instructions label on the side. And so it's very compact, relatively lightweight. This is fired and empty, so even more lightweight, but relatively lightweight for an anti-tank weapon. Keep it in a pack or uh, strap to a pack. And when you're ready to use it, pull it apart, at which point the compactness doesn't really matter. Your rear sight flips up front sight flips up. Interestingly, our front sight is a different pattern. I don't know enough about the law to know how significant that is. Um, ours has uh, aiming crosshairs, wires, and then graduated red range markings below it, whereas the variant in the game has the full window of graduated range markings. Another really good looking gun, got the SVD, of course. I would, yeah, I'd like to have a play about with, with this in particular, just to see how the, the, the ranging system in the scope, I'm sure that's all scaled correctly, so that you estimate the height of your target, would therefore work out the range, and try and make your first shot count, uh, rather than walking them in like I would tend to do on something like Battlefield. Now this this final shot that we, we see here with the looking along the rifle from the left-hand side, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but uh, the, the SVD has a bayonet 
flag on it that is designed to take a bayonet. Not unique, shall we say, to designated marksman rifles. The British Army actually looked at a bayonet mount for the L129 sharpshooter rifle. Not as far as I know been fielded, but um, they did look at it. So being not quite a sniper rifle and not quite an infantry rifle, there are there's an argument for there being a bayonet lug on there. There certainly was in 1963 when this thing was, was introduced. Thanks for watching as always, guys. We really appreciate it. If you'd like to drop us a donation, you're very welcome to do so via the link in the description. If not, or even if so, check out our Royal Armoury social media channels. Uh, we've got Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and our own YouTube channel as well. Thanks very much, guys. Take care.